Vaporwave. It's a genre soaked in the ghostly nostalgia of the early internet days. It's also the perfect music to throw on in the background of whatever you're doing. The beats are chill and the imagery is nostalgic. I remember when stuff was designed this way unironically. A ton of companies back in the day had packaging that just looked like this. Is this a vaporwave? No. It's the cover of my math book from like third grade. These statue busts and geometric shapes and abstract backgrounds. This was all just around and you didn't really bat an eye at it. But I do remember staring into the depths of this warped matrix, wondering what could be at the bottom of the vortex of this space. It was about the only thing I found interesting about math at that age. But yeah, this is all the stuff Vaporwave resurrects. This imagery, this aesthetic if you will. So when I saw Broken Reality pop up on the Steam store one day, I was immediately drawn to the look and style. But I wasn't expecting much more than a meme, a game that was simply capitalizing on the vaporwave aesthetic. Then I started playing. Broken Reality is a first-person mirror held up to our own online obsessed world and, well, reality. It was developed by Dynamic Media Triad and released for PC on November 29th, 2018. And at first glance, it seems like a game that would be all style, no substance. Using familiar memes and jokes to poke fun at internet culture in a bright and at times garish vaporwave inspired world. And it does do all that for sure. But dig a little deeper and you'll find something more to all the tongue-in-cheek comedy and influencer roasting parody. Something quiet lonely, and even a little bit sad. It's also not just a walking simulator. There are puzzles and gameplay challenges that actually require a bit of skill to overcome. It's not a high skill ceiling, which is for the best, but still, this is a game, not just an art project parading as one. No offense to walking simulators either. There are some great ones for sure. In Broken Reality, you take the role of a user of this kind of virtual reality slash social media space called Natum 2045. When you first start the game, you're standing in this shallow pool area with the game's logo hovering in front of you. You have full control here and start the game through a terminal to your right with your Simpsons-like thumb. So I tied an onion to my belt, which was the style at the time. After which, you are transported to the entrance of one of Natum's servers. Before you can enter, you have to sign up for an account with the lady at the desk, who is referred to as Onechan. She welcomes you back at first, before apologizing, explaining that she's mistaken you for someone else. Mysterious. Onechan has prepared a newbie account for you, and you're tasked with meeting the top users who are hanging out in the current server, Domo Paradiso. She tells you that after you've gained some likes and rank up to trendy, you can even go meet the admin. Right away, the vaporwave-infused art style sings with a world that looks like a Lisa Frank folder come to life. You even start in this psychedelic tunnel, ringing with the faint sounds of a dial-up modem attempting to connect. They make it sound much more palatable in the game than it ever was in real life. For those of you who don't know or remember what a dial-up modem sounds like, let me refresh your memory. Now that all our ears have stopped bleeding, let's talk more about the look and feel of Broken Reality. The game is obsessed with 90s and 2000s tech, internet, and pop culture iconography. I mean, you save at a vending machine with these cans that have a watery, chromatic kind of design. I really can't place these. Like, I don't know exactly what they're parodying here, but it feels like something I've seen before. I mean, I know like the Red Bull cans and the Arizona iced tea bottle and all of that, but these, I don't know, kind of reminds me of Capri Sun, but those came in pouches. Anyway, you'll also find bags of Doritos, or, excuse me, Dorados, t-shirts and hats with various logos and phrases, retro video game parodies, it runs the gamut. Lots of little Easter eggs and stuff like that if you just stop and look around. The world is divided into five different servers, each with their own theme. Domo Paradiso is an amalgamation of pretty much every internet-related thing of the last 30 years. I've already mentioned the Lisa Frank dolphins and metallic-tinged water, but then you've got flying email birds, ad windows as decoration, viruses 
bridges blocking your paths, hyperlink panels hovering in the air, and heaps and heaps of memes, parodies, and parodies of memes. And this is all just the first area. There's also Axis Plaza, which acts as a hub for the rest of the game and resurrects the hazy pastels of 80s beach imagery. Aquanet is an abandoned server that has a lost Atlantis theme, complete with Roman-style statue and ruined temple structures. Love Cruise 64 has this blurry filter applied to everything, which I took as a knock on the blurry textures of the N64. It doesn't look quite the same, but I think that's what they were going for. Then there's GeoCity, a gigantic neon metropolis that acts as the central location for all of Natom's top users. The moon here reminds me a little bit of those old McDonald's Mac Tonight commercials. There's also a final area, the internet, which has a much darker and more corrupted look to it, but we'll examine that one more in the spoiler section. A lot of the early game areas are just really chill. It was kind of amazing stepping into Domo Paradiso for the first time and just marveling at the creativity on display. There are browser windows stretched as textures across surfboards, a shopping mall straight out of an 80s or 90 kids dream, a zen Asian inspired area, and every new server presents new surprises or visual gags or jokes from the characters. The music is another huge part of what makes the presentation shine. Each server has its own main theme, but the music shifts shifts in different areas, which keeps things from becoming stale. For example, the Asian-influenced area of Domo Paradiso features an Eastern-style song with shimmering shamisen strings. The beach area has a low-key ukulele strum going on. The shopping area sounds suitably Muzak-inspired. Love Cruise's theme shifts as you move from the inner workings of the ship to a restaurant area to the upper decks with a bright theme that fits its boat party atmosphere. GeoCity has a more airy, ethereal sound that fits its dreamy nighttime vibe. I especially like the music and the vibe of Aquanet, a mostly underwater stage. Along with snow levels, underwater levels are some of my favorite in games. I know some people really hate both of these kinds of areas, mainly due to ice physics and wonky underwater movement being implemented, but I don't know. Even with those frustrations, I've always just been really captivated by them. They also almost always have the best music in whatever game they're in. There are also moments all over when the music will fade out and you'll be left with just the ambiance, which can range from calm and soothing to slightly off-putting. In any case, it's a joy to walk around and explore these places. If a game can make you want to just hang out in its world, then it's going to be high up on my list. And this game is, huh, how do I put it? Chill as fuck. Across all the servers, you'll find other random users who are represented as single-colored, featureless figures, perpetually stuck with their faces in their phones. Some even trip over themselves as they walk around, not looking where they're going. Then there are the top users, who get their own individual models usually of the low poly variety. But some are overblown 16-bit sprites, like Chozai here, or the captain of the cruise ship. The world really feels like it was cobbled together by people with varying tastes and interests, which turns out to line up with the story of the game, which focuses on the origins of Natum and the desire of some of its users to escape the stifling, paywall-restricted, algorithm-obsessed structure of its world. Frightening. The goal of Broken Reality is to gain likes and raise your rank to access new areas and become a top user. Most of the servers are initially locked off behind paywalls that require a certain amount of likes to get through. Pretty much all of the servers are broken up into separate self-contained sections, making them feel bigger than they actually are, and it makes the pacing of the game feel smooth. You can get likes from, of course, liking things, but also as payment for doing NPC quests, destroying viruses, taking photos, and shopping. You always feel like you're progressing by finding new areas within areas, or gaining access to new places by completing quests and ranking up. Your menu will help you keep track of your likes and your rank, as well as provide a map with NPC locations, a logbook for tracking quests, and a list of key items you've gained in each server. Like I said in the beginning of this video, the game isn't just a walking simulator. There are puzzles and platforming sections. 
This is where your various tools come into play. The Liker is the first one you'll pick up, right in the beginning of the game. You use it to interact with NPCs and objects in the game world, but also to like various ads, which will boost your own likes. It's kind of great walking around with that yellow thumbs up out too. Feels like you're just approving of everything you're seeing. Yeah, you're cool. You're cool too, but not you. The camera will most likely be the second item you collect. With it, you can see these photo icons that float around the stages. You'll want to try to fit as many of them as you can into each photo you take to increase the amount of likes you get. You can only see these icons when you have the camera equipped, so for most of the game you'll want your camera out to make sure you don't miss any juicy photo ops. The icons can be a bit finicky though, and like to disappear for seemingly no reason, so you'll have to mess around with your positioning to get them all in a shot. You'll also do a quest early on to acquire a sword, which can cut down viruses. These block your path at various points, and you gain likes for getting rid of them. You also get a credit card, which will put you into massive debt when you first get it, because who knows how credit works, right? It's just invisible money. There's also a little mini-game attached to this called Shopping Sprees. In shops, you can buy up all the merchandise, and you gain a multiplier by selecting the correct items that appear at the top of your screen. The higher your shopping rank at the end of the spree, the more likes you'll be rewarded with. All of that unmitigated spending comes back to bite us later on, though. Honestly, I don't really like the shopping spree minigame. It's neat at first, but the models of the items that it shows you at the top of the screen sometimes don't match up with the in-world items you need to buy. Like, sometimes the color palette is slightly off, and a lot of the items are also small and hard to see the details of. They spin around too, so you'll need to see the logo of a hat or t-shirt or something, but have to wait for it to turn around, all the while your multiplier timing is running down. Meh, it's just not all that much fun. Luckily, you don't have to do it when you shop, but if you want as many likes as possible, you should. There's only one time in the whole game where getting the full shopping spree is actually necessary to progress, and it was kind of a pain in the ass, but yeah, I got through it. Another fun tool is the hyperlinker, which acts as a hookshot of sorts. You'll see these floating hyperlink panels all around, and you can use the hyperlinker to fling yourself towards them allowing you to traverse the levels faster and overcome different platforming obstacles. These get more and more complicated as the game goes on, and in some places you'll need quick reflexes to make it through without falling and having to start over. Finally, there's the bookmark tool, which allows you to set down an icon and then instantly teleport there from anywhere within the server. Every puzzle that makes use of this was extremely fun to try and figure out. The one in the engine room of Love Cruise immediately comes to mind, and there's also one in the hedge maze near the end of the game that's really good. I actually wish there were more puzzles like this throughout the game. You can make use of the bookmark tool at any time though, so there are probably some neat things you can do with it. Definitely has a lot of speedrun potential, I'm sure. But do people actually speedrun this game? Oh, of course they do. Three minutes? Seriously? Ah, well, I knew they would use the bookmark tool, but not in the way I figured. Speedrunning, am I right? A few of the items also get upgrades. You can acquire a glitch lens for your camera, which allows you to see secret walls and paths as well as invisible orbs that can be connected to open certain areas or create new ways forward. This upgrade is essential to completing the game. The credit card gets upgraded to a platinum card at one point, which actually earns you money for purchases and can slow down time during the shopping spree events. At one point, your sword also gets greased up, allowing you to break shop windows in GeoCity for a specific quest. All of the items are fun to use and most are well implemented. You can even find other uses for some of them beyond what you're told they're used for. For example, you can use the slow down time function of the Platinum card to help with some of the late game hyperlink platforming challenges. For the most part, the game runs smoothly. I never had any crashes, though there are some UI issues I ran into. Like how quitting out of the game works perfectly fine in the beginning, but will just break by the time you get to the second area, and you'll have to Alt-Tab or Alt-F4 to quit for the rest of the game. I also had a bug occur where I was stuck not being able to change my equipped tool or open the menu. I noticed that this occurred whenever the game takes control away from you for short cutscenes. Sometimes NPCs will call out to you, and you'll have control wrestled away for a few moments. 
If you have the camera selected, which you most likely will, since like I said earlier, you always want to be on the lookout for camera icons, then when you get control back, you won't be able to swap items or open the menu. This is troubling, because you need the liker to interact with the save vending machines, and the game doesn't have an autosave feature. The only way to fix this is to reset, so you could end up losing a lot of progress if this happens. Unless you've played the game before and know when these events are going to take place, then you might be screwed. I'm not sure if it happens with any other items selected. Save often is my advice. I also had a glitch one time where the slow-mo from the platinum card didn't wear off, even though the visual effect did. I was still moving at normal pace, but everything else was in slow motion. It was actually helpful for me at the time, as I had a quest where I had to throw cans into recycling bins. And the further you are from the bin, the more money you get. So I would aim and throw the can close up, then run as far away as I could. It got pretty annoying after that though, and again, the only thing that fixed it was a reset. Other than those few things, everything else functions pretty well. Though I will say, not having a run button is a bit annoying. I know it's a chill game that you're supposed to just take your time with, and that's all good, but you do have quests and objectives and NPCs to talk to, so just having it as an option or getting an upgrade for it or just some kind of stamina mechanic so you couldn't run all the time or something like that would have been nice. You can move diagonally though, and it's slightly faster than just walking straight. So now I'm going to talk more about the story. If you're interested in playing this game for yourself, which you absolutely should, then skip to this time. If not, then I'm going to spoil the shit out of this game. So, we're off. Ah, oh, jeez. In between all of the side quests and just general wonder of wandering around the different servers, you'll run into some characters in Broken Reality who divulge bits of what's going on underneath the surface. The first of which is a robot shopkeeper with a Shiba Inu head named Furo Robato. He's also wearing a Bindouche hat that we can buy off of him for a quest at one point. And can I buy that hat in real life, please? Anyway, Furo Robato has a sad story to tell about the two creators of Natum. It all started as an innocent creation, a cool place for people to hang out. But as it became more popular and gained more users, investors came in. The opportunity to make money became too strong, but the two creators were divided on this. One of them called it the end of fun, the other said it was organic growth. In the end, they took the paychecks. Natum expanded, users started to isolate in different sites, paywalls were raised, and monthly subscription plans reared their ugly heads. Eventually, the two creators split up, and no one knows where they are now, but their accounts were never deleted. Spooky. After hearing this story, you start to notice a sort of loneliness hidden underneath the shiny, commercial veneer of everything in broken reality. In the shopping mall, as you're wandering around, you'll run into little pockets of space that don't have any background music, and you'll be left with only this background noise of undecipherable conversation. It's kind of unnerving. But put all that aside, because you gotta buy, 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 take photos, get likes, fill that void, that constant need for validation, to compare your own successes to the successes of everyone else in the world, because that's the only way you'll find any real meaning in life. Go, 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 never look back, never self-reflect. Ah! We run into Furo Roboto again in Aquanet. There's a hidden library in one of the temples in the underwater area, and he's been using his premium membership to travel around all of Natum's servers, and has collected what he calls the old writings on the shelves of the library. They're short lines of text, supposedly chat log conversations between the two creators of Natum. From what I could gather from reading them all, the two creators started Natum with shared hopes, made the tools that we've been using so that other users could continue to create and expand Natum beyond what only the two of them could think of. They also created an AI named Zero-Chan, which was meant to be used as an assistant. It's hard to decipher from the fragmented messages and bits of code here, but Zero-Chan seemed to have either become sentient or been hijacked by someone else for dubious purposes. It's clear the two creators don't agree on Zero-Chan's function, with one of them commenting that she made a site for viruses to reproduce and grow. It's all very obtuse, but intriguing. Another important character is the admin. We first meet him in Domo Paradiso, where he warns us that the basis and source of this world has been corrupted for a long time, and he thinks he's found the altar that guards the original... something. He disappears before he can finish his sentence. Cryptic. 
We next run into him in the Love Cruise area, along with Captain Johnson. They explain that they want to leave Nadam and saw her in their dreams. They fear being deleted and are looking for the altar. This is also where you learn about the strange floating triangles. You've probably seen a few of them by this point, maybe even collected a couple. There are apparently three in each server, and you'll need all of them to access the altar. Then there's the strange user named Fisherman who pops up throughout, helping us along through various jams. For example, he fixes the bridge that breaks and sends us down to Aquanet in the first place. He also might have been the one to break it in the first place. He hands us a platinum card in GeoCity after we work our way out of debt. This card actually earns money for purchases, allowing us to access the D-Top building, an exclusive hangout spot accessible only to the 1% richest of the rich top Natum users. When we finally earn enough money to get into D-Top, it lives up to its exclusive tag for sure. There are gold escalators, a diamond encrusted car, a view from from a balcony that looks down on the streets below, it's also completely empty. A hollow monument to the excesses of consumerism that's brought us here. There's a wall of TVs, a dead box 2 game console, an empty throne, and the only escape from this desolate decadence is to jump from the balcony. <sighs> that's dark, man. Finally, there's Error, a mystical woman avatar who really doesn't offer any answers just further riddles the few times you meet her throughout the game. In the end, there are no answers to any of the mysteries the game presents. It's all up to interpretation. Who are these top users really? Why are they helping us? Why does Onechan recognize us when we first enter the sign-up area, but sheepishly try to cover up that recognition? Are we one of the creators? Could Error or one of the other users who seem interested in the background of Natum's creation be our counterpart? Again, there are no solid answers. Which was the developer's intention? But here's where I'll add another spoiler tag. The final area of the game takes a turn, and the ending is quite a gut punch. So if you're still watching, I'm giving you one last chance to bail to try it on your own. Alright, that's it. Now let's enter the internet. The internet is the final area of the game, and unlike all the neon and pastel stylings of the other servers, this place is dark, decayed, and unwelcoming. A place for viruses to reproduce and grow, perhaps. This is where you'll really have your hyperlinking and secret finding skills put to the test. All the zones have foreboding names, like the Cradle, the Plinth, and so on. The Cradle has streaks of psychedelic lightning flashing across the sky, with a lake of blood below and tentacled black creatures writhing under its surface. These areas are really awesome, because they're so dark and different from the rest of the game. I really like the vibe here, especially the Blood Lake, but especially the Hedge Maze. It really is a maze, and there's a huge sense of uneasiness as you explore it. Even though there's nothing here that could be considered an enemy per se, this whole last area has such a sinister vibe that the server itself feels like an enemy. If you check your map, it'll be blank, and the address bar will say Old Internet implying that this was maybe one of the first areas created for Natum that has since been corrupted. This leads to the final area, where you'll need to follow an orb of light through a maze-like arena. After navigating the maze, you'll wind up in death and move through the mysterious triangle. Suddenly, you're dropped into a dark space with an open door before you. You enter a dilapidated apartment. The style of the visuals have completely changed. We've made it back to the real world. Pale, waning sunlight leaks through the boarded-up window. Cracks run through the plaster walls. The fridge is empty, bathroom in a state of disarray. Photos pinned to a corkboard show a woman who looks like the Onechan from Natum. There's one photo of a couple kissing on a beach, the girl's head burned by the ember of a cigarette, most likely. The pin holding the photo in place driven through the man's head. And a young woman sits at a table with her hand resting on a shattered tablet screen the fractured pattern in the spiderweb-like shape of a fist. You move around her to get a better look at her face, but her head forever turns away from you. The computer across the room, which had been off when you entered, is now switched on. Broken reality is on the screen, but the program has stopped working. You interrupt the process, but an error occurs. You try to find a solution, but none are available. You try to ignore the problem, but you can't. Your only course of action is to shut down. It's an action that can't be undone. Even if you try to cancel, it's too late. And at the last moment, as the screen goes blank, you turn back to the room, and the young woman has stood to face you.
When I first experienced the ending of this game, I was shook. I mean, painful is a word that comes to mind. And yeah, it's a lot to take in, especially from a game that started off eight hours before just making fun of funny internet things. To wind up here, in such a place, at the end, I think really cements the whole experience and journey. And it also holds up the pillars of what the vaporwave movement was really all about, wielding nostalgia and retro commercial imagery as a reaction against the hollow excesses of internet and consumer culture. It's a style where the meaning comes from the lack of meaning, really. Just the emptiness of it all. I don't know. It's fascinating. And broken reality is fascinating. Just the way the gameplay and the story are paced and build to this finale that just rips your heart out, it's brilliant. And that ending track, man, ooh, gets me every time. Broken Reality is a game that's much more than it originally seems. First impressions might make it look like a cash-in on internet memes and pop culture jokes. And it also might appear like a walking simulator with no gameplay depth. And again, no knocks toward walking simulators. They're fine for what they are. I mean, I play adventure games regularly, so I have no room to judge or anything. But I was just pleasantly surprised that there were actual puzzles and skill-based exploration involved. It was great. Also, the story underneath it all went to deep and dark places that I did not expect upon first booting up the game and being greeted by that pastiche of 90s and 2000s internet culture. The way that the exploration, the slow drip feed of the story, and the increasingly darker progression through the areas of the game all converge into a really emotional ending is all extremely well constructed. Vaporwave as a genre uses nostalgia and retro imagery as a weapon against the self-centered hollowness and consumer-centric culture of our current times. And it feels like this is the message that Broken Reality is trying to get across as well. That the internet is a fun and entertaining place, but it shouldn't be a substitute for real life. In that sense, Broken Reality is more than just a fun game or a meme. It's an experience worth having. And if anything, it's got a robot Shiba Inu shopkeeper with a hat that says Bin Douche. I mean, what more do you want? Well, that's the end of this video. Uh, if you liked it, then smash that like button and subscribe and comment and tell me your thoughts and your feelings on everything. <laughs> I also have a Twitter, uh, so you can follow me there. I have another video, of course, coming soon, so uh, be on the lookout for that one. Um, anyway, until next time, Broken Reality, check it out. Dungeon Chill, out.